everyone, welcome. Today we'll be studying the muscular system, specifically for those of you who are studying for the T7 or the HESI A2. The information regarding the muscular system is the same for both of these exams. Let's go ahead and get started. Here we have a muscular arm. If we took a close look at the muscle here, it looks like this. Notice that the muscle is attached to a tendon on both ends. Tendon attaches muscle to bone. If we take a closer look at this muscle, we will see many layers that are covered in connective tissue. This connective tissue merges out from the tendons. The most outer layer of connective tissue is the epimysium. The epimysium covers the entire muscle. Muscles are formed by multiple bundles called fascicles. Each fascicle is covered with a connective tissue called perimysium. Fascicles are made of multiple muscle cells, also called muscle fibers. Each muscle cell or fiber is covered with a connective tissue called endomysium. Each single muscle cell is made up of multiple myofibril. So we start off with an entire muscle that is made of fascicles. Fascicles are made of muscle cells or muscle fibers, and the muscle fibers are made out of myofibril. Okay, so I want to show you a picture that is a little bit better illustrated in case it might help you visualize the single myofibril that makes up the my muscle fiber a little better. Notice that the myofibril has these zigzags and lines on it. These are actin and myosin proteins. So let's take a close look at the myofibril because this is where the action happens. This is where the muscle contraction takes place within each single myofibril. Here we have our Z-lines. Uh, attached to our Z-lines, we have actin. Actin is known as the thin and light protein. Between the actin, we have myosin. Myosin is the dark and heavy protein. The point between the two Z-lines is called your sarcomere. The sarcomere is known as the functional contractile unit, meaning this unit or sarcomere has the ability to contract. During a muscle contraction, the actin filaments move closer and closer towards the midline and the myosin filaments move closer and closer towards the Z-line. This movement or interaction between the actin and the myosin is only visible if we take a closer look. Notice that there are these projections coming out of the myosin. These are called myosin heads. And on the actin, there are these little boxes on every bead. These are called binding sites. When a muscle is ready to contract, the myosin head will attach itself to the binding site. This forms a cross bridge. So notice that all these myosin heads are going to latch onto the binding sites and form cross bridges. Once attached, the myosin will pull the actin towards the midline. This motion is called a power stroke. If it helps, you can kind of think of it like a paddle in water where actin is the water being pushed and myosin is the paddle pushing the water. Notice that after the actin is pushed by the power stroke, the myosin is closer to the Z-lines. The closer the myosin is to the Z-line, the more the muscle is contracting. Now this is important because you're going to need to identify a muscle contraction and a muscle relaxation on a sarcomere. So let's go ahead and zoom back out and take a look at that one more time from a bigger perspective. Here, the sarcomere is relaxed. You can tell because the myosin is far from the Z-lines and the actin is far from the midline. Here, the muscle is contracted. Notice the myosin close to the Z-lines and the actin close to the midline. Okay, so now we know how a muscle contraction happens. Basically, the myosin and actin sliding against each other creates a muscle contraction. Now, let's look at some factors that involve muscle relaxation. These two factors are proteins called tropomyosin and troponin. Both troponin and tropomyosin block binding sites during muscle relaxation. When binding sites are blocked, the myosin heads cannot bind or move the actin filaments. Therefore, no muscle contraction can take place. When a muscle contraction needs to be generated, calcium triggers tropomyosin and troponin to move out of the way, exposing the binding sites. So let's take a quick look at how this happens. Let's focus in right here. Calcium comes along and says, hey, troponin and tropomyosin, we need a muscle contraction, so you need to move out of the way. 
Now the binding sites are nicely exposed and the myosin heads are able to attach themselves and initiate a muscle contraction. One last time, the process of muscle contraction is enabled by calcium. Calcium moves troponin and tropomyosin, exposing the binding sites. The myosin head then attaches to the binding site and propels the actin in the direction of the midline. This causes a shortening and thickening of the sarcomere. This is a muscle contraction when the sarcomere is short and thick. When the muscle is at rest, well, we don't really need the calcium at this point, so the calcium makes its way back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum and the binding sites are again blocked. So this is the resting phase of a muscle. We haven't talked about the sarcoplasmic reticulum yet, but all you need to know is that it covers each myofibril and it stores calcium. Here's another image in case it might be helpful. You'll notice that the sarcoplasmic reticulum covers each individual myofibril. And remember, again, it stores calcium. Alrighty, so we've learned about muscle contraction, we've learned about muscle relaxation. Let's now take a look at the neuromuscular junction. The neuromuscular junction is the point at which a nerve fiber communicates with the muscle fiber. So here's an axon terminal of a neuron, and these are the vesicles that contain neurotransmitters. The neurotransmitters involved in the neuromuscular junction is acetylcholine. By the way, we haven't talked about the sarcolemma yet. All you really need to know about the sarcolemma is where it is located. It covers the muscle fibers, as you can see here. Therefore, any nerve impulse or action potential must go through this membrane in order to have an effect on the myofibril. We also have the acetylcholine receptors on the sarcolemma. Generally, there are a lot of steps that are involved in creating a muscle contraction. If you've already taken a &P, you know them, but for the sake that we don't need to know all that information because we're just studying for the TES exam or the HESI A2, I'm gonna leave a lot of details out, okay? So don't worry. So beginning with step one, ACH or acetylcholine is released from the vesicles. It travels across the synaptic cleft and it binds to a receptor. Step two, the action potential travels to the sarcoplasmic reticulum. The sarcoplasmic reticulum then releases calcium into the cytoplasm. Step three, calcium will move troponin and tropomyosin so that the binding sites are exposed. Step four, myosin heads will attach to actin binding sites, forming cross bridges. By the way, ATP is the energy source responsible for moving the myosin heads. So that includes moving them onto the binding sites when contraction is needed, as well as removing them from the binding sites when muscles need to relax. So when a muscle needs to contract, ATP will swoop in and move the myosin heads onto the binding site. Then when the muscle is ready to relax, ATP will again swoop in and give the myosin heads energy to latch off of the binding sites. Okay, I want to show you again this picture of the sarcoplasmic reticulum so you can visualize exactly where it's found. It surrounds each myofibril. Sometimes the sarcoplasmic reticulum gets confused with the sarcolemma. So here's a picture that shows both. The sarcolemma surrounds the muscle fiber while the SR surrounds each myofibril. Okay, so that's it for the neuromuscular junction. Let's go ahead and finish up with types of muscle tissues and their functions. We have three types of muscle tissue. The first is smooth muscle. You will find smooth muscle in the walls of hollow organs, the walls of blood vessels, and respiratory pathways. Smooth muscle cells are in a branching network. They are tapered at each end, and they have one nucleus in the center of each cell. Smooth muscle is involved in producing peristalsis. Peristalsis is this wave-like motion and it's, it's produced by contraction and relaxation of the muscles. So for example, we have peristalsis in our GI tract. The, this peristalsis helps move food. 
Smooth muscle also helps regulate the diameter of an opening. So for example, in blood vessels, when the smooth muscle that surrounds the walls of the blood vessels, when it's contracted, it narrows the blood vessels. It causes uh, vasoconstriction, right? And when the muscles are relaxed, there's vasodilation, right? The, the opening gets larger. So next we have our cardiac muscle. This is found in the wall of the heart. The most important characteristic to remember here are the intercalated discs. Secondly, the striations. So the striations here are seen more abundantly and the intercalated discs are further spread apart from each other. So this is really important about cardiac cells. The intercalated discs not only attach the cells to another cell, but they also allow electrical impulses to travel rapidly from one cell to another so that the heart contracts more coordinated and more rhythmically. These intercalated discs are only found in the cardiac cells. Other characteristics that the cells have are a single nucleus and a branching network. However, in my opinion, they're not the most important to remember. The cardiac cells contract the heart in order to circulate the blood. It's also important to note that these cells are influenced by the nervous system and hormonal fluctuations. Lastly, we have our skeletal muscle. These are attached to bones. These cells have dark striations, are long and cylindrical and have multiple nucleus per cell. The most distinct feature of this cell is that they're long and cylindrical in shape. No other muscle cell is going to be in this shape. Skeletal cells help produce movement because they're attached to the bone, so when they're contracting, they're able to move our skeleton. By the way, remember, muscle attaches to bone via a tendon. So the tendon is the connective tissue that attaches bone to muscle. One last super important thing here. Remember voluntary movement and involuntary movement? Involuntary means you have no conscious control over it. So for example, you would have no control over your breathing. You would have no control over your heart beating. So can you guess which of these are involuntary? Yes, smooth and cardiac muscle are both involuntary. That leaves skeletal. Skeletal muscle is the only voluntary muscle tissue here. So think of it like this. It's attached to your skeleton, and we mostly use our skeleton to move our body. Running, jumping, throwing, these are all voluntary movements. So remember, skeletal, your only voluntary muscle tissue. Okay. Lastly, I just want to sum up three major functions of the muscular system, beginning with movement. Movement, muscles attach to bone, and when muscles contract, it is able to move our skeletal system. Secondly is posture. Muscles maintain the upright position of our body by holding a slight contraction of our muscles, like our abdomen, our neck, our back, all of that is going to help us stay upright in position. This is also known as tone. Lastly, muscles generate heat. This happens in two ways. One, peripheral vasoconstriction, which conserves heat loss. And two, shivering. Shivering increases body heat. Heat is created because it is a natural byproduct of muscle cell metabolism. And that's it for this video. Thanks so much for being here, guys. I hope you learned something new. And until next time.